many simulations have been showing how, how critical that is if you really want to understand the behavior. Okay. And let's see what else. Um, right, so one other big difference, I think, is that MD tends to not be in interested in the exact trajectory of the system. So we're not interested in necessarily in getting from, one, from the initial conditions to one particular point and understanding how does that evolve. Because when you go to do experiments, you're measuring time average quantities. So you could decide to run one long experiment and to average along, along that, or you can run many, many simulations and just and average all of them together, because the, at the end of the day, you want to compare to experimental results. So again, I try to compare and contrast the, the differences between these two fields. Like I said, one of, both have one over our potential. There's still the idea of coarse graining. So we can, in exactly as we do zoom simulations, you can do de-refinement of water molecules. So you can have pseudo-water molecules uh, that will, so further distances away from the protein that's sitting in the center of your box, uh, you can de-refine. Now, it's interesting that we've been kind of touching on the subject uh, here, uh, but it's been actually, this idea has been around a long time in, in, uh, in MD. It's using either experiment or particularly basic QM quantum mechanical simulations to inform the models that you use, basically the subgroup. So we've been touching on that using ideas, you know, star formation, how can we use that, those high-res simulations to influence the subgroup physics of galactic simulations. So this kind of idea has been around for a while. Big difference though, uniform density in molecular dynamics. You don't have a huge density contrast, you don't have the shocks that you, you find in, in molecular, in astro. So there's uh, that in some ways makes the domain decomposition easier. So, and time steps, okay, I'll just put this up, just to have an idea of what we're talking about. One femtosecond is sort of the order of magnitude of time step. Uh, obviously, an asteroid completely depends on your problem, these density contrasts can, the orders of magnitude are different. It's typical in, I know in PPD graph and other uh, n body codes to have a, a run system for your time stepping. And that's usually based on acceleration. Where as an MD, what they're actually doing is they decompose based on force. So you have high frequency forces, maybe the molecules have a high frequency vibrational mode, like a spring between the atoms. Uh, you also have angular and torsional terms. And these different forces can operate at different time scales. And so that is splitting on those, on those forces rather than on the actual uh, accelerations you have in astrophysics. And as I said before, the experiments uh, measure averages, time average solutions. So whereas we, or the astro community, uses large volumes to understand them to gather their statistics. And the ICs are not critical in MD. It doesn't really matter because you're doing these time average solutions. You can pretty much start anywhere and just follow the trajectory, or you can start from many different places, and do very, very short runs, and then average those together. And because of the assumption that the whole system is they got it, then you, those two quantities should be identical. Whereas in galaxy formation and end body simulation, the whole process is what we're trying to study the, the, the group. There's been a number of common solutions over the years, a lot of algorithm, algorithmic developments have actually come from MD before they came into astrophysics. The fast multipolar method, one of his first applications was in uh, MD. E wall was also originally for uh, electrostatic potential, it was first used for MD simulations. Uh, but all these things are, are shared between these two communities. So, you know, one of the ideas has been going on for the last few years, particularly in Switzerland, has been a movement to try to bring different communities together to, that are solving the same problem. So one idea is, can we develop some sort of a library that sort of abstract these decom uh, domain decompositions of the FMM thing that we can share together? But without, and this is critical, we don't, no one wants to lose out on efficiency just because, so they, they can support somebody else. They want to have the most efficient code. So how can we find a balance between these two? And why are we computing in parallel in the first place? So usually it's of time to solution. If we had an infinitely fast machine, we wouldn't need parallelism. So, so what does that mean? 
faster time to solution. And we're sort of debating what does exascale mean? What does it mean to, to run an exascale? I think maybe we can also think in terms of time to solution aspect of it, not just petaflops or exaflops or some other measurement like that. More like how, how much faster can we get to a, a solution? And what is the definition for us of a solution? So it could be one big problem, obviously. Or it could be many smaller problems that you run in parallel. So the, the, the bail loop right here, right? But in the end, that is still a time to solution because that's the, the measurable uh, quantity. So it could mean big problems. But again, I don't think we've already touched on this, so I think it, it, was, it was good that we had already been thinking about this. Are we running the right kind of simulations? Can we fit, rethink what is really important uh, for the problems that we want to run on, on exascale? How can we take advantage of the enormous aspect of it? So, this is sort of my very generic, vague vision, and it may be a bit naive, but I thought I would throw it up there anyway, that big things will become small, right? And we've always seen this, it's just general trends that you'll have, a, the CPUs will be the transistor size, or, you know, the, the, right now we're at 20 odd nanometers, that's going to shrink. Things will get, things that are big will keep getting smaller. To the limit, yeah, but they will continue in the near future at least. No, you don't, you disagree? Well, they're, they're, still, they're still talking about going to the 7 nanometer scales and things like that. Like, so, but it, yeah, but there's a limit. There's absolutely a limit, I agree. But for the moment, things that are separate will merge. So, we also heard, started hearing a little bit about this earlier today. There was a debate about what's going to happen with the GPUs and the Intel 5 and things. It's always happened again in the past. It's always been the case that you initially you may have started with two with an accelerator of some sort, the floating point operator uh, chip or something, and it being integrated into the CPU. And I think this is going to happen again with the Phi and the GPUs. They're going to be sitting on the CPU. So all these problems that we have right now are just going to disappear. Maybe they'll be replaced by another accelerator, but, but at least for the moment that that problem will, will disappear. And within five to ten years, I think. And if you have one of something, you can always network them together. So the point with that is just that you'll always have communication problems. So that, that, that problem won't really go away. And I don't think it's going to be the case that if you shrank the entire machine to one small unit, you know, that you would be satisfied with that. You would want to have then many of those. Right? And things that are reliable now, or we basically treat as reliable, are going to be unreliable. So fault tolerance that. You, you rely on the network mostly being up, you rely on the nodes being up, but those things are going to become unreliable at this scale. And of course, everything's going to be limited by real physics, as we've been talking about. The size of things, the power, the consumption, the speed of light might be an issue, but just being able to communicate and synchronize everything. And so maybe there are problem, uh, solutions with asynchronous, maybe we can do asynchronous solutions. And then that kind of brings me to, uh, Extra hours for any of those things. Co-design. I mean, actually, quite maybe But <laughs> what if we can change the architecture? We've been people want to think about what, new architectures, and you know, one idea is what if there was a way of having just the hardware give us a transpose, basically, of our data structure. So right now, sometimes an algorithm is best expressed as a packed solution of X, Y, Z, some quantity. Maybe and then in, uh, in later on in the same program, you really want to be able to vectorize everything. So you want columns of X, columns of Y, columns of Z. Maybe the hardware should be able to support that. And we can just say we want to treat the, use this data structure as a transposition. Or well, on the fly XPGA. So reprogramming the machine on the fly, depending on what you want to be solving. The different parts of the machine could be reconfigurable. Obviously, this is not. You know, next year stuff, but just thinking about what could what could we do? Now it's still in the wrong place, but boy, let's change the language. I mean, we've been programming in the same kinds of languages which are, were expressive of the way people thought about the machines when they were first designed. A very imperative style of programming. But maybe we can extract all these things and get and just focus on the problems you're trying to solve, 
And there have been lots of attempts. I mean, this, and this kind of idea of abstraction of detail. People complain, oh, I won't have control of my algorithms. I don't know what they're going to do. But this has always been the discussion. People have you know, argued about this efficiency when, when C and Fortran were first developed. Oh, I can't do anything efficiently. I have to program an assembly. I think it's the same discussion that we're having now. And there are other languages, for instance, like Fortress was a, uh, one of the contenders for one of the U.S. programs to develop a new language that way you can express data types have, with having mathematical properties associated with communities. And then when you, do, you say, I want an addition of these things, the compiler, knowing that the, the objects you're adding have certain mathematical properties, can then decide for you, based on the architecture of the machine, What's the best way to solve it? Can, it? can it do a decomposition like a tree structure? Because it doesn't matter in what order I add these, the machine adds these objects together. But, and this other idea of decoupling the optimizations from the actual workflow. And this is, again, not a new idea. It, it exists in certain languages. There's this idea of stream fusion, where right now we, we have many loop, we have many, if you wrote out the code, you would be generating in steps, as you think about it, you would be generating many multiple lists. And of course, you wouldn't want to do this, so in C, you would simply write one loop and you would iterate over the, over the individual elements and combine them as is appropriate. But we don't really want to think about that because it makes it harder to then change those optimizations later if we want. We want the compiler to be able to figure that out for us. And this does exist, but it was not in the languages that most people are using to, to solve these problems. Well, that's all I have to say on, the, on these topics, so... Uh, Questions? No ideas? Yes? I have worked on FPGAs, but not in the context of astrophysics and mostly on tape drive design. Designing software to control buildings, but um, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I don't remember. It was many, many years ago, honestly. Yeah, George. Sure. Yeah. No, it's several orders. And you have to be very careful about the time stepping because you can actually run into resonances. So if your time step of the, of the smallest frequency, of the highest frequency, I should say, is, is too large, it, will, it can actually induce a, it can create a resonance with, it, with the slower frequencies that you're doing. You have to be very careful. Yeah. No, it's usually just the, uh, yeah, you got it. All the molecules have fast and slow frequencies. Frequencies. 